I want to introduce today Eric Fetaplace. He is a 2011, right, Eric? Yeah, 2011 grad from Gislis. Correct. And he's um, he's going to talk a little bit about his job, but really he's going to be talking about data visualization, and um, he does want this to be a interactive session, so I will encourage you, as I'm sure Eric will too, if you have questions, to please put them in the chat box, um, and he'll stop. This is a nuts and bolts session. And this is um, an advising um, programming series that I do. We try to do everything virtually, but sometimes we will also have um, on-campus sessions. So this is the last one for this year. Um, look for more starting up come September. So without further ado, Eric, take it away. OK, great. Well, um, what I'm going to be talking about is data visualization, obviously. and this slide has my, uh, my contact info and stuff there. Uh, around the internet, I'm basically known as FET23. Um, so that's also my Gmail, if you want to follow up with me later, FET23 at Gmail. And um, just briefly, who I am. Um, as Meg said, I was a 2011 guest list graduate. Uh, I graduated in May. I was an on-campus student. Um, I worked in the main reference department, which I believe has a different name. They change the name every couple of years to, to keep you on your feet. And I work at a community college, which is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, so if you haven't considered community college librarianship, but you know you want to do academic librarianship, please give us a holler. Um, I think it's an excellent institution to work for, as well as just a noble social mission of open education for everybody. Uh, I am an emerging technologies librarian, so obviously I do a lot with technology. I tend to focus on the web uh, because I think that's where technology happens. Um, so I do a lot of web design, I do some development, I do a little bit of programming, um, and that's sort of the deployment mode of much of my technology. And for the purposes of this session, uh, the most pertinent bit here is that I am a data visualization amateur. It's something that I'm interested in, that I've read a little bit about, but I don't, I haven't done anything that's particularly awesome in my opinion. So my goal for this session is that by the end, you will be capable of making something cooler than I ever have. So hopefully you'll come out of this looking a lot better than I do. And uh, because librarians love acronyms, I've brought along some for you. Um, so here's a whole bunch of things that I do. Uh, don't ever do this much stuff. It makes you a stressful wreck. And um, the only ones that are maybe pertinent for this session are the last two there. Uh, I definitely encourage people to check out the Library Code Year interest group. It's an interest group under LIDA, which is a division of ALA, um, where a bunch of librarians getting together to learn programming. Um, it was founded around the Code Year uh, program by Code Academy, which is they send you a lesson every week about a programming language and you, you learn a little bit. And it's just a really great community for learning more and upping your skill level. And I would strongly encourage people to check us out on ALA Connect. And then finally, um, I'm also on the ACRL Tech Connect blog. And I feel like it's okay for me to uh, self-promote here because I was a big fan of the blog before I even started writing for it and it's a great way to stay up to date in the tech world. Um, we have a lot of really great writers, uh, former guest list people too, like uh, Jim Hahn was a writer for us recently, Margaret Heller, uh, who's a really great uh, web librarian at uh, Loyola, I want to say. So definitely check this out. And as Meg also alluded to, uh, I really want people to ask questions, okay? So this, this session is going to be most useful for you if you ask questions about what you want to know rather than me ramble about what I think you should know, okay? So, you know, my opinion is not particularly important here. I would rather have you interrupt and throw me off course uh, than me just spout a bunch of irrelevant babble at you or tell you things that you already know. So, please. Uh, you know, just type a question into the chat room, uh, do whatever you have to do, uh, get my attention, and I'd, I'd much rather address your concerns than just go through my slides like a robot. So without much further ado, let's get started here. Um, <coughs> actually, not the Riddler. It's the crazy guy who tells you how to save money from the, the government, but good. Um, 
The first word in data visualization is data, and it's also the most overlooked part, okay? So you have to have data, and you have to have high quality data in order to have a successful visualization. And I think that this isn't the sexy part, right? Like if this was a, a workshop on data, you wouldn't come to it. It would be tremendously boring, and you would think, my God, it's somebody showing us Excel spreadsheets all day long. Um, but this is the important part, right? And data has been around a lot longer than data visualization has been. And honestly, it's a prerequisite. You have to have good data in order to do some kind of visualization. So I am going to start off by boring you and lecturing to you about data because it is so freaking important. And to sort of drive that home, here is the best list of um, the data visualization process as I've seen it articulated. This comes from Ben Fry's book, Data Visualization, which is in my list of links um, for the people that joined just a little bit ago. I'll type that in again. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you can scroll up and see the previous chat history or not. Uh, but it's a really great process because it's very thorough. It covers every single step. Um, and I should also mention that I, I actually found this via uh, Ben Murray, who is another data visualization guy. Uh, he works a lot with D3, which is something that I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, that's the letter D, the number three. Well, that'll come up later. Um, but in any case, what's important here, right, is that the majority of these steps are about data. The only part that has to do with visualization is steps five and six, okay? And those are steps five and six. They come later. So you first have to do these acquiring data, parsing it, filtering it, and mining it before you even get to something that's visualization. And then the other thing that I think is important here is that step number seven, because it is a recent development, okay? So data visualization used to be entirely static as of about a decade ago. Okay, 15 years ago, maybe, let's say. It, it was something where you made it. It was in a print book. Even if it was published online, it wasn't interactive. It was something where you just looked at a static visualization. That is not the way things should be anymore because of the web. So again, I, I have particular opinions about the web. I think it's where technology happens. It's where innovation occurs. And data visualization should be interactive. It absolutely should be. It shouldn't occur on the printed page, um, except as a means to get you interested in some website that has an interactive layer. So that's just incredibly important. And what's most important about interactivity, I think, is that it removes the monopoly over meaning that the creator has. So what I mean by that is when somebody generates a visualization, they cannot understand all the ways that it will be used. They cannot detect all the patterns that it will reveal. Instead, the audience actually becomes an active participant in constructing the meaning and interpreting uh, the data. And that's all done through interactivity. So that was my, my long spiel on that. And unfortunately, we won't get very much into that because interactivity is still really hard. It's still something that people are learning how to do. It's not something that uh, is often plug and play. It's not going to be a very easy thing to do. It's certainly not as simple as creating a chart in uh, Excel, for instance. But we don't want just any data. I think, in particular, we want actionable data, data you can do something with. So I hope that I'm talking to a lot of practitioners here. Maybe some of you are um, in the PhD program. But for the most part, librarians do stuff, OK? We don't do research in particular. We do our jobs. We try to make our services better. We try to make our patrons happier. We try to improve things. We try to be more efficient. So you want some kind of data that you can do something with. And in order to do that, I think there's a very particular process that helps you along the way, and that's the, the best way of acquiring actionable data. And why do we need actionable data? Well, it's because, again, without data, you can't really do anything. Okay, so if you came to this session thinking, yay, visuals, pretty flight patterns and colors and everything, copious visuals cannot overcome data paucity. This is my own contribution to the field of data visualization. It's like the only thing I've come up with on my own. But 
you, you can't take a poorly structured data set and instantly turn it into something awesome. You can't take meaningless data and turn it into something interesting. You can't take a simple data set where it's just like ex extremely obvious, you know, like something that you might put in a Venn diagram really and make anything that's a truly compelling visualization. You have to have some rich data before you can even start thinking about a visualization. So how do we get rich data? We ask a question, okay? So this is, I think, the, the best way to frame your collection is to think of a question, something that is important to you, something that's a pressing concern, and libraries have plenty of these, right? We're not exactly in the best situation. We, we have to do a lot of things with a little bit of money and uh, staff time, so there should be plenty of questions on your mind. For instance, let's take a look at reference, and that's going to be the general frame of all of these examples, I'm going to be looking at reference data because it's something I'm familiar with and, and I know the question. So a question we might ask about reference is how do we staff the reference desk? And this is an awful question, okay, because it's, it's just not specific enough, right? Like what does staff mean in this context? It's, it's way too broad. What does how mean? You need to frame a good question in order to collect good data something that's specific and has an ob obvious correlate in terms of the data points that you want to collect. So the way that I would rephrase this question is how many staff of what level of professionalization do we put at the reference desk at which times? And you can see that this is going to be a, a much more bloated specific question, right? Because I'm, I'm calling out exactly what I mean in terms of the question. It's kind of broken down into several different parts, okay? And so we can see these parts and sort of parallelize them into the form that will ultimately collect data. So when we start to break this down here, we see there's how many staff, right? That's one piece of the question. Then the next question there, the next data point that we need to acquire is what level of professionalization? And um, <clears throat> in case that's a little obscure to people, uh, that's like, do you need a student worker behind the desk? Do you need a um, paraprofessional, somebody who works in libraries as a professional but doesn't have an MLS? Do you need an MLS? And then at the top of that chain is, do you need a subject specialist? Somebody who is not only a librarian but possibly has a second degree in a particular subject area. Um, does, does anyone like work in reference as an assistantship or anything, or does, does this make sense to me? Just throw a quick comment in there. Okay, Brian says he does. So that, that categorization makes sense. Oh, awesome, we got lots of reference people. Um, and then finally, obviously, we need to know which times, right? Like when we staff the desk is a, is a big part of this. So when I lay out those categories here, um, ultimately the data points we see as listed below are we need to know the number of interactions because that correlates with how much staff we want to put out there, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a measure of busyness. Um, we want to know the level of complexity because more complex questions should be answered by people at higher levels of professionalization. So maybe you don't want to have a GISless grad assistant out there. If people, if professors are coming up being like, I need to talk with you for two hours about my latest research paper, which is incredibly specific and involved. And then finally, obviously we need to collect the time of day. So we've got ourselves a bit of a sophisticated form here that we need, right? We're, we're collecting three different data points. Does that mean that we need um, three different categories on our form, three different fields? Well, no, not really. Um, this form that I present here captures all of this. And how does it do that? Well, number of interactions and time of day are basically implicit, right? Let the machine do this for you. It would be insane to design a form where you have to fill out exactly the time of day it is when you answer a question. No, what happens is an application just generates a timestamp as, as, as soon as the form is submitted and that timestamp is correlated with whatever was entered, okay? So on the back end, what this would look like is April 25th, Thursday, 12.36 p.m., read scale three, 
hyphen light reference, right? There would be two columns and, and that's what you would have. And then obviously you can calculate the number of interactions in any arbitrary time scale by uh, doing a, an operation later, like sum up everything that happened in between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. on Thursday, April 25th, okay? Um, the, the read scale below stands for reference effort assessment data. So for the people who maybe uh, don't do reference or, or do reference and haven't heard of it, it's basically just a simple scale that, that measures complexity, right? So at the one scale you have where is the bathroom, which is, you know, my favorite question that I get asked in the library because I know the answer. Um, and at the six scale we have that professor doing his PhD research who needs you to sit down for like a couple hours because he's looking for primary source material that's incredibly difficult to find, stuff like that. So it's, it's just a simple measure. Um, I, I am responsible for the hideous form that you fill out, at least partially um, responsible if you're in that central reference division and read scale is one of the, the items that you collect there. But, Another point that I wanted to make at this, at this stage is that this is a simplistic scale and a simplistic form rather, and that's very important. Um, it's going to increase your response rates on uh, staff submitting this. It's going to increase the accuracy because you only have to teach staff one thing. You just have to teach them to read scale. You don't have to teach them how to fill out 15 different forms. Um, so I do think it's, it's good to develop a targeted set of data that's very limited and uh, because of that is going to be more high quality is what I'm getting at. So always, always develop a nice slender form, if you can, uh, that answers the particular question that you structured. And libraries have lots of cool data, okay? We are not at a shortage of data. So um, some examples there, obviously I'm talking about reference interactions. Reference interactions are very, very rich, right? It's not as simple as just complexity. You can measure subject area, topics, et cetera. Um, things like Google Analytics, uh, also very interesting. Your, your web traffic is another incredibly rich uh, set of data. And then things like what's in your catalog and, and whether or not it circulates. So, you know, here on the left, uh, I hope everybody recognizes the horror that is a mark record. Um, and this, is, this one in particular is for a, a data visualization book. And then um, we also have started to do a lot of user research, right? So when you do surveys of your users, for instance, University of Illinois does LibFall, uh, I believe. They did when I was there. And uh, that's just a massive user survey instrument. Yep, exactly. It's, I believe it's like LibQual++ now because they, they want to make you think it's a programming language, not a survey. Um, and then finally, like user experience research. And those are things like doing focus groups or um, usability testing. Those are all incredibly important ways of generating data about your um, users. But it's also, it's, it's, a lot of it is textual data. And that is important. Text is data. Because of the um, programs that we have and uh, all of these different natural language processing applications, text is data more so than ever before. And there's basically this entire field, digital humanities, right, where that's what they do is they, they treat text as data. That's a bit of a simplification. But, um, you know, they, they go back and they analyze all these historical texts at a massive scale using um, software and programming. So, where do you go and get data? Chances are, if you are an MLS student, you do not run a library and you don't get to collect a whole lot of your own data. Um, there's free data all over the web, right? This is no longer a problem. This is a non-issue. Um, data.gov is where the U.S. government um, releases its data. Uh, I think Twitter archives are really cool. So if you're on Twitter, um, you can download a nice bulk of all your tweets and they give it to you in a massive CSV and they give it to you as a series of uh, JSON files, um, which I'll go over JSON in a little bit. It's just a structured format for data. Also, um, Wikimedia uh, publishes massive amounts of awesome data that you can go and investigate Wikipedia, which is cool. And that's, again, that's on my uh, list of links. So all of these are included in there. And then finally, like, you're a librarian, just go and find it, right? This, this isn't a problem. You, you know how to find things. If you're interested in something, go out, find the data. It's not tough. All right, I've, I'm done with boring you, okay?
I'm, I apologize for the long and preachy section that just happened, but data is important. Now, let's do something fun. Let's get to data visualization. And it's pretty tough to talk about data visualization because it's just like so dependent on the particular data set that you're doing, right? That defines a lot about what's going to be an effective visualization. So what I'm going to put forth is just a handful of important principles and a few illustrative examples. And hopefully this section, it's, these aren't rules, right? This is not the Ten Commandments of data visualization that I'm handing down here. These are guidelines and uh, inspirations that you can take forth and hopefully apply to um, data sets that you want to work with, okay? So my, my first one here is that the purpose of data visualization is to help people digest data. It's to take complex, often multivariate data sets and make them into something that's not only easy to interpret, but easy to sort of navigate and discover new patterns and, and interact with, right? Interactivity again. So this is an example of a uh, PowerPoint slide, and it comes from a New York Times article that was titled, We Have Met the Enemy and He is PowerPoint. This slide is meant to visualize the uh, Afghanistan war, right? And it is a terrible data visualization because this slide only communicates one thing. Stuff is complicated, right? That's all this says. Like, it's really, really, really freaking tough to read this and get some kind of other message out there, some kind of deeper understanding of the war. In fact, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I've looked at this a little bit. I'm pretty sure I understand less about the Afghanistan war now that I've looked at it than I did before. So it's, it's just totally in the wrong direction. And I think if you find yourself doing this, um, if your visualization starts to look like this just incredible mess, show it to somebody and be like, hey, tell me what's going on here. And if they can't articulate in a couple sentences what you're trying to visualize, you need to go back to the drawing board. And chances are you didn't fail at the visualization step either. So remember those seven steps earlier? This to me looks like a failure of parsing and filtering. The data set should have been trimmed more before being visualized. So illuminate, don't obfuscate. That's, that's your first rule here. Don't make things more complicated, make them more digestible. So now let's, let's look at an example here that is incredibly sophisticated and just does a really wonderful job of visualizing something that's tremendously complex. So I'm going to switch to a new tab here. Um, I know there's probably a bit of delay, so I'll give you a moment to catch up. But this is a Gapminder world, and it visualizes lots of sort of international data sets that are published by bodies like uh, the UN or, or the WHO, World Health Organization. Uh, I'm going to hit play here, and it's going to animate through a little bit. And I want to ask you a question. How many variables are being represented on this graph? Okay, so go ahead and start typing in ones. You know, be like, um, I don't know, reference complexity, for instance. That's a variable, right? Like, wh what are the metrics that are being represented here? So if you could just type them in as you think of them. Uh-oh. Have I lost everybody? Right. Time, absolutely, right? Yeah, so the year is, is being counted. So that's one. Life expectancy, yep. So the y-axis is life expectancy data. Um, country, says Zena, absolutely, right? We can see which country. These, these particular uh, circles are. So each circle is represented by a country. Um, income, says, says Amy. Absolutely. The x-axis is income per person. Um, so along that line, we, we see that. It's GDP per capita, which is different than income per person, but that's roughly it. Continents, yeah, right? Like they're color-coded according to continents. And that alone distinguishes so many trends, right? Like what's the most obvious trend of this? It's that Africa is an incredibly disadvantaged continent. You know, they're, they're at the bottom left of this graph, which is bad. That means low life expectancy, low GDP per capita. And then you look at other things, and, and you can see that, you know, the other continents generally fare better than that. Um, and then finally, population, right? So several people said that. The, uh, the diameter of the circle is population. 
Okay, so six different data points. This could have been the Afghanistan war effort mess, right? But it's not because it just does a wonderful, amazing job of visualizing all these different data points in a completely intuitive manner. And I, I can understand patterns here incredibly easily. Like one thing that's very interesting is when you hit play, I don't know if people noticed it there, but World War I and World War II are distinct events in terms of these data sets. You can see things start to jump around and get crazy. Life expectancies drop because a lot of countries are at war. A lot of people are dying. Um, so it's just one of the best examples of, of visualization because it's incredibly multivariate and yet easy to digest. It's also incredibly interactive. Okay, so we just, we said about like six different data points, right? Um, pretty much all of these are configurable. So I don't have to have my y axis be uh, life expectancy. It could be something like aid received, poverty and inequality, blah, blah, blah. There are about a million different uh, things that I can make it uh, signify, okay? And I can do the same with my, um, with my x axis. I can do the same with my size of circles. I can do the same with even the color of the circles. So Gapminder world, mind blowing, just one of the best things ever of, of any of the things. Okay, um, real briefly, back to my slides here, because I wanna show another example that speaks to sort of the goals and uh, purpose of successful data visualization. So one thing is exploring multivariate sets in a very easy manner, right? And, and we saw that just now. The other thing though is helping us contextualize incredibly large or sophisticated uh, numbers, okay? So what I'm gonna show you now is the billion dollar program by Information is Beautiful. Uh, so let me just switch to that real quick and sort of explain what's going on here. So this is a tree map, which we'll see more of later. Um, tree maps basically represent quantities as rectangles. And um, you know, so the larger the rectangle, the larger the number, and because rectangles have uh, area, that helps us see things uh, comparatively, but it also allows us to categorize by color, and that's another thing that's going on here. So the billiard and dollar ogram, um, it categorizes things like uh, war, for instance, is a light purple here, and uh, earning is a, uh, a green, et cetera. And we can see relationships, right? Like, Maybe if the U.S. had decided not to invade Iraq and Afghanistan, we could have paid off the debt of the entire African continent. And, you know, political aside, maybe that would be better for global stability as well. But in any case, it enables all these comparisons of disparate yet gigantic figures that we can't really have otherwise. You know, like it's really hard to understand some of these things because of their scale. And what demonstrates that the best is I'm only showing you the top half of this. And I know that scrolling is a little bit uh, janky, so um, bear with me if this looks weird. But what I've done is I've scrolled down to the bottom half of this tree map, okay? So the bottom half, which is about the size of the entire top half that includes many, many different data points, the bottom half is the cost of the worldwide financial crisis from, um, you know, 2008. Uh, Bear Stearns, you know, right? All those banks that just don't exist anymore. 11.9, uh, what is it? So this is the billion dollar gram. So that's 11.9 trillion dollars. Yeah, thank you, Yasmin, <laughs> for helping me not embarrass myself in math. Um, it's a massive figure, right? And that's where this visualization shines because it helps us contextualize something which is basically like the size of the Milky Way galaxy. Right? It is a number so incredibly large that when I tell you $11.9 trillion, you're like, oh, that's great, cool, whatever. It, it's just impossible to contextualize that, but this visualization does it. It's worth noting that I think this is a flawed visualization because there are lots of interactions that could happen that don't, right? This does not do that seventh step. In fact, it kind of represents the best practices in data visualization of a decade ago. It's a wonderful print visualization. This would look gorgeous on a nice big poster. 
it doesn't work that well on the web because it doesn't take advantage of any of the web's native features, right? It's just a picture. Yeah, good. Brian is going to help me with some of my uh, transitions here, actually, because that's exactly where I'm going uh, in a couple of slides. Um, first, I want to I want to propose one of Edward Tufte's uh, my favorite princ principles of Tufte's. And uh, Tufte is a, a well-known data visualization guy. Uh, if you have any interest, you've probably heard his name before. I think it's important to understand that he is a dated visualization guy. He he writes for print, right? So again, that seventh step does not exist in Tufte's work. He has no advice for you on how to make something interactive. He does have this brilliant maximize data to ink ratio principle. And basically what that means is if, if the ink on the page isn't somehow representing a data point, erase it. Get rid of it. It's useless. So here on the left we have every chart that anyone has ever made in Excel. And it's awful, actually. It does a lot of things wrong. Um, so all of these different little pieces are basically useless and don't help us understand the data set anymore. So I did a quick redrawing of this that only leaves data ink, right? So the ratio on the left is something like, you know, 70% of the ink is maybe data. On the right, it's near 100%. You know, I am not the world's best data visualization person, so um, I still, I, I could probably do this better somehow, I don't know how, but it basically gives you exactly what you need to know. And the extraneous things that it throws out, like, why do you need a, a legend for two data points that are the same color? Yeah, we get it. We know that, like, orange represents the color, right? And yet a stunning number of Excel charts that I see do this. They just leave the legend in by default. Please delete that. We don't need these runner lines. We can tell that a particular point is, like, above 50, below 75. That's not necessary. You don't even need the scale on the side if you just tell us what the specific data points are. So 68.7. 92.3, et cetera. You don't need an X or a Y axis here. Like, what are they doing? What is the X axis doing? This isn't going over time and stuff. Just give me the labels. So basically, I deleted a whole bunch of stuff, and I came up with something that's very, very concentrated data. It's just data, none of the, the extraneous junk. So I think this is just a brilliant principle. Um, it's totally worth checking out one of Edward, Edward Tufte's books to see how he redraws poor visualizations, and you can learn a lot from it. Um, his books are heavily, heavily redundant, though, so don't feel like you need to read, like, all four or five of them. Um, you can probably just look at one, and you probably don't even need to read it. You probably can just look at the visuals and, and get something interesting out of it. And then, finally, another principle that I, I take from Tufte, and this is how he articulates it, is don't make a duck. Well, what's a duck? It's, it's actually taken from architecture, the term, and it's essentially uh, pieces of a building that have all form and no function, right? So architecture at its best is a marriage between those. It, it has both form and it's aesthetically uh, pleasing, but it's also functional and usable. And obviously that correlates with data visualization, right? It's not just about making something that's functional, that's data-driven, but it's also about making something that's so aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing that it's easier to understand. Um, and so I, I have this uh, example here, Anatomy of a Librarian. Uh, I just want to do a quick poll. How many people have seen this before? Um, you can use like a little checkbox, I believe, in your um, participants window to vote like yes or no. We can just real quickly. Oh, okay. So most people haven't seen it. That's interesting. I thought, I thought most people would have seen something like this. Um, so anyways, let's take a look at it because this is like the quintessential duck. And I think it actually, uh, it actually speaks a little bit to the difference between infographics and data visualization. Infographics are, are a lot of design. There are a lot of duck and very, very little data. And that's what's going on here. So let me just like tear this thing apart because it has a lot wrong with it, even if it seems interesting. Um, my first problem is on the right-hand side with the various bars. I start reading this and I think, okay, uh, so gray-colored librarians make $15 a year, and then blue-colored librarians make $20, and then light gray-colored librarians make 11 
74, what? What's going on? Oh, your legend is down at the bottom after the data, so now I figure out that these don't even represent different librarians. The blue one is a registered nurse, and the gray one is an average for all occupations. Okay, great. On the left-hand side, let's witness, like, the worst histogram you've ever seen, okay? So this should be a histogram, probably, is what they're doing. And, and a histogram is just you sort data into different buckets and then say how many are in each bucket, right? So you would do ages 20 to 24, 1%. Ages 25 to 28, 2%, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, instead, they've decided to compare things that aren't at all uh, equivalent. So that first bucket, yeah, of course it's 1%. It's ages 20 to 24, a range of five years. The bucket next to it that they're comparing it to is age 25 to 54. It's, it's like four times as, as much. You know, that's ridiculous. And then, you know, what's, what's up with the glasses? What, is that like like the different age ranges, we're, we're throwing in some ageism on the side of our inaccurate data, great, you know, that's not at all meaningful. That's, that's the quintess, quintessential duck right there is like, you know, let's represent an age range with like a silly set of glasses. But wait, there's more. Okay, so again, scrolling is a little janky, so I'm, I'm going to assume that things look weird. Um, but basically I've scrolled down and there's a picture of a human head uh, divided into two ranges, uh, left brain is, is red and right brain is blue. Again, there are data problems here, okay? Uh, my wife is really into neuroscience and she hates it when people do this left brain, right brain comparison because it's basically a bunch of baloney. There's not a whole lot of scientific evidence for this very, very distinct uh, division between the two. And there's certainly not a lot of evidence for whatever these random tasks are that they've assigned to a particular side of the brain. So right brain, keeping up to date with modern te library technology. How is that a right brain thing? Like what? That, that doesn't require any sort of like uh, analytical skills, which I think is what they're implying the left brain is. This, this is just ridiculous. Like it's the primary problem with this part is that uh, the data is unbelievably inaccurate. But the second part is that like the visualization too is mostly a duck. It doesn't really help us understand the data any better. It's just like, oh, this would be pretty if it was a head wearing glasses and we pointed some arrows at it. Cool. Um, then comes the best part of this entire visualization, right, which is that they actually put something just in a sentence. I bet they, they decided to draw this out as like, I don't know, a book with like $60,000 worth of book highlighted or something and then they were like, no, this looks silly. Sometimes you just write something in a sentence for the love of God, you know, like this is a simple statistic, just present it as a statistic. Um, and then below that we have some donut charts. Um, some of them only have two data points, uh, which doesn't necessitate visualization. Again, it's data paucity. There's a whole lot of data paucity going on in this and they're trying to make up for it with pretty pictures. And then down at the bottom is my very, very favorite part. Um, so you see the a woman's workplace uh, piece, hopefully, right? So this is extremely sparse, right? There's like almost nothing to say here except that 78% uh, of the workforce is women. This is another thing where it's like, use English. Sometimes the English language is the best data visualization you can do. 78% of librarians are women. Bam, all you needed to say. For one thing, like there's this really fun fact of how when you divide things into two categories, the second category is implicit, right, in the percentage. You don't even need to say that 22% are men, so that's a waste. Second of all, let's reinforce some gender stereotypes while we're at it, you know. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Like, this is, this is absurd, just minorly offensive. I, it's more ridiculous than offensive to me. And it's, it's quintessential duck. You know, it's like, here we have nothing to say, so let's say it with shoes. What? Just, just awful. So if you see something like this, hopefully you will be equipped to just be utterly harsh and unforgiving with it. Okay, so uh, we've progressed through the data visualization portion, sort of, and now let's talk about a little bit of the tools that you use to make this happen. Uh, I'm going to discuss a few of the primary ones, there are a lot out there though, and one of the resources I give you is just going to be a massive, massive uh, list. So um, we don't need to, to hang too long on any of these because they're just things that you need to go and check out. I'm going to start off with uh, IBM's Many Eyes, 
which is a pretty easy to use one where like a lot of it is just paste in text and get something cool back. So my first example is that I have this um, visualization of survey responses. So I mentioned earlier that text is data. Text has never before been more data-like because of the ways that we have of analyzing it. And um, this is the name of our learning management system, Angel. And the open-ended responses to this, I can visualize them in this sentence tree that's, that's very nice and it allows me to zoom in on different words, right? So I can not only see relative, um, relative uh, occurrences of a particular word, but I can also zoom in and see it in context, which makes it like a million times better than a word cloud, right? Because I can actually see the context of the sentences. And you can get some very easy messages out of some very tough data. Like text is not easy to work with, but many eyes has a really nice uh, sentence tree for working with that. And you can search for any word here, by the way. So I can see that only one person even mentioned the library, which is kind of sad, right? The students, they, they don't really care about us. Um, this is just one example of many different visualization options available in many eyes, and they're all fairly intuitive to work with. There, there isn't a lot of trouble setting them up. So this is just kind of a list of the various different things. Um, Again, uh, so those tree maps we saw earlier, they have some tree map options here uh, towards the bottom half of your screen that are really great. And they have some really great options working with text. So strongly encourage people to check that out. Be aware that Many Eyes is, is quite limited though. Um, Many Eyes runs in a Java applet, which is unfortunate. Um, I, I believe you've had experience with Java because that's what we're running right now, but it's just, it's really an awful experience. If you go to the, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, if you go to the website and like try to load something up, it will take forever and then it will crash your browser and then you will get a virus and then your computer will die because Java is just that bad. Um, it's also, you sacrifice a lot of customizability by using a plug and play option like many eyes. Uh, like you can't change the color of any arbitrary data point. You can't move things around necessarily. It does do a very good job with interaction though, as you saw in that example, right? I could click on words, I could search for different words. So um, there, there are benefits and, and trade-offs to using it. A similar option is Tableau Public, which is just another um, piece of software that you can plug data sets into and it gives you pretty well-constructed, uh, pre-formatted visualizations. Um, so here we have a tale of 100 entrepreneurs, for instance, and um, it categorizes things into different categories and, and does draws nice lines and, and gives you things. And there's interactivity here. Um, the only sign of it is that light gray click to interact in the upper left, but uh, you can sort by different industries. So this is a graph of companies, obviously, right? And you, you could sort by like tech or healthcare or, or whatever. So there is interactivity. It's also worth noting, like what did we just learn though? Data to ink ratio. Uh, this fails terribly at data to ink ratio. It has all of this extraneous lines running everywhere, interrupting the, company, the graph. Like, why does this graph need to be in a box? That does not help anything. Um, why does like growth, by history, growth history by company need to be, uh, have a gray background to it? It's just, it's, it's not really good. And um, again, that's something you sacrifice when you use a piece of software. Uh, because you can't customize everything. It, it'll be easy. It'll have a, a very quick um, data to final product uh, uh, transition, but it's not going to enable you all the power of the pros who make, you know, the data visualizations that we see online, like the, the billion dollar program. Um, finally, I don't know much about Tableau Public because it only runs on Windows. So I, I actually have never really used it myself. I just know that it's a popular option. So let me give you that caveat. And um, because you're a librarian, you probably like massive lists of things. I don't, I don't really know what, uh, what's up with that, but there's a, probably the best list is selection.datavisualization.ch. Again, that's on my list of links that I shared earlier, so don't feel like you need to write it down but it just has a really great um, selection of many different visualization options. But a lot of them involve uh, programming. So I'm a little bit biased here. Uh, I really like programming. I think it's the best way to have thorough control 
over your um, data and your visualization and that it's well worth learning. So again, let me give a shout out to the library code year interest group. Um, if you want to learn some, some JavaScript or some Python, it would be really great to, to join that group because we're a supportive community and we, we can really help you out. Um, the primary ways to do visualization, there's lots of options, but there are two clear front runners. The first is D3, which is a JavaScript library. So it runs in the browser without any like Java plugins and it's really, really great. It was developed by people at the New York Times who really know what they're doing. The New York Times has great visualizations. They also do great JavaScript. Um, they have some of the premier JavaScript developers um, of our time. So really cool, really nice uh, uh, library that lets you develop things. Here briefly I will show you the gallery to give you a sense of its extensibility. Um, just unbelievable. You can do just about anything with it but it does require programming. There's not going to be a whole lot of plug and play with this. You're going to um, need to get into some JavaScript and, and tweak some code and make it work, but it can do anything. You know? So we see some very interesting charts in here. We see a bubble chart. We see a nice calendar view, a chord diagram, lots of really, really interesting, cool things. Um, briefly back to my slides. Uh, another thing that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is processing. Um, processing is both a programming language sort of a, on its own, but it's also a app that you can download and play with. And it's, it's pretty easy to get into. It was meant to be for uh, designers working with data. It's not meant to be for like nerds who love code. So I, I found it fairly easy to, to work with. You can, um, you can go right in and get something working and it, uh, it can export to JavaScript so you can run it natively in the web where it will look good and it won't need Java. Um, Brian asks if processing has an API. Uh, that's kind of a confusing question. I would think of processing as a programming language. Technically, if you want to get down to it, it's actually an API wrapper around Java um, processing is written in Java and extends Java, but it would be best if you didn't even think of that because Java is a monstrosity that nobody should ever work with. So um, my recommendation is if you're going to work with processing, export it to JavaScript or work directly in the, uh, the processing API in JavaScript. Uh, that would be the way, way to go with it. So let's kind of do this. All right, so I, I want to walk through a D3 tree map using reference statistics. And it's going to be awful because I tried to do this in the last couple of days and I just, I didn't have enough time. I, I don't know D3 very well and <clears throat> I wasn't super successful. But I, I think it's important to see the process actually happen and that's going to help you a lot more than me continuing to ramble. So here I have um, the basics of a tree map and I, split it out into those different steps that we saw, right? So you start with a table of data. This is collected on a web form um, that has many, many different options and it gets reported into the back end here. So we see things like what the date is, what the time is, the location that the question occurred at. So these, you're, we're seeing uh, directional questions at our circulation desk. Um, a, a rough read correlate, R-E-A-D again. So, um, Directional questions are ranked as a one because they're very um, not complicated, very easy to answer. Uh, what mode of communication it occurred in, which is in person. That blank column is subject, uh, like if it's English or psych psychology, et cetera. Directional questions don't really have a subject, so that's why you're seeing it all blank. And then finally, um, you know, an open-ended note for staff to put in things where you can see that, of course, people ask us where the bathroom is. So let's parse and filter that a little bit, right? This is an awful data set to work with. Let's strip it down. So basically we just delete out a bunch of columns. Um, I'm specifically interested in, let's see if uh, the different um, subject areas have their questions asked in different modes of communication. So what I've done is kind of stripped out um, a lot of categories and I'm left just with the measure of complexity 
just with the mode of communication. And then again, that uh, empty column is actually uh, subject. And if I scroll down, you'd see that there's a few um, subject things in there. Finally, uh, let's get this into a format that I can use, something that's nice and structured. So I mined it, I ran some spreadsheet equations on it, and sort of compiled it into a JSON file. So JSON is basically, it's like a, uh, a JavaScript data carrier format. Um, it's actually incredibly easy to understand. Uh, it looks kind of like weird, probably like this, but it's basically like um, there's a key and then there's a value. So for instance, the, the value of name is reference data. And then my, my next key is children. And then that has an array in it. So it has several um, different things associated with it. And then beneath that, we have another array. And eventually, we get down to numbers and stuff. And the important part about JSON is that it's structured. Um, so it can contain things like arrays. It can contain numbers. It can contain structural. Uh, it can contain strings. It's not just like a flat CSV text file. It has structure to it. It can have hierarchical structure. And um, it's very lightweight, and it's very, very easy to work with in JavaScript. Um, this is like the data format of the future, essentially. Like in library school, they, they cram XML down your throat. Uh, I could probably never work with XML again in my life, and I would be OK, because most APIs and most data is uh, available in JSON now, and JSON is a lot easier to work with. So just a slight aside, this is a link to the Wikipedia article on JSON, which gives you a nice overview. Um, finally, we represent this. So again, I've chosen to do a tree map here, uh, which we learned about a little bit earlier. So it's just rectangular representations of quanti quantitative information, right? And um, this is basically just me plugging in the, the data. So in, in the background here, things look fairly complicated, but most of it was just copying and pasting. I went to an example tree map, and I copied all their code, only like half of which I understand, and then I plugged in my data, and this is what I got in return. Okay? So I have a basic representation. Um, but it's something that I definitely need to work a lot at, right? Like there's tons of problems with this, we can tell. It is not the world's prettiest um, data visualization. So let's refine a little bit. Okay, so I went through, I said, you know what, that original color scheme um, was, was too uh, close together. Some of the colors weren't quite distinct. I chose a more limited, more focused color scheme that enables uh, contrast between them better. I centered the text, which actually is incredibly difficult in CSS. Um, so unfortunately, the web is still a little bit behind in, in some things in terms of design. Uh, and I also made the text uh, scale according to the size of the boxes so that, you know, you can actually read it. Unfortunately, there are still problems. Um, there are tiny little text on the left-hand side. You can see that it, it's not really readable. Um, so that, that is a difficulty. And then I layered some basic interactivity to address some of those refinement problems on top of it. So, First of all, um, what happens is if I hover over one of these little text things, I've, I've added a title attribute in HTML that tells me if it's like chat or email or, you know, I hover over here and it, it tells me that it's phone. Um, finally, I added a, uh, a bit of JavaScript code to update this heading up top. You see it says government. Now if I switch over to this one, it says English, okay? So this makes it more obvious um, what subject category a particular slice is. So I can see, hey, what's this big green one? Okay, so we get a lot of psychology questions, particularly in person, um, but more psychology chat in person than English chat, for instance. And I can see that just as a visual comparison. And then finally, I see, hey, we get a lot of computer questions, but strangely, not many of them come in by computers. They're mostly asked in person. Um, so those are some of the things that I can see from this. Honestly, this is a pretty horrible visualization and you're probably all thinking that I'm basically a scam at this point because it's, it's obviously not very good. A lot of things are unreadable. And there's a lot left to be done in terms of uh, interactivity. So here's a better tree map made by uh, the people at D3. And 
what's interesting here is that you can change the interactivity allows you to change what the size of the rectangles represents. So I can go from size to count and everything transitions really beautifully. So that's like the sort of thing that I would add next to this is I would say, okay, this, this, these boxes represent like number of interactions. What if instead I made it average complexity? What if I averaged my read scale and allowed you to switch between them? That's the sort of interaction I would like to layer on top of this. And then finally, um, you can also make tree maps zoomable in D3. And again, it's like so, so slick. So it works really nicely. So um, here's like a tree map and I'm not sure why the color isn't loading. Color loads in Chrome, but not in Firefox. Um, but if I click on a particular uh, segment, so this would be like the correlate to uh, English or psychology. If I click on a segment, I'm instantly zoomed in and I can explore it more in depth. So that would be a very, very nice uh, enhancement so that some of those very small regions on the left hand side of my visualization could be explored more in depth. So those are basic interactions that we could add on top of that. And uh, Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, I'd love to answer questions if anybody has them, uh, pertinent, pertinent or not. You know, if you want to ask me about being an emerging technology librarian, if you want to ask me about community colleges, that's cool. Obviously, data visualization as well. Um, I dropped my link in there once again. If people want to to look at that, or you know, go ahead and share with other people who are interested. Um, and again, I can be reached on the web as FET23. I'm very active on Twitter, so if you're on Twitter, uh, go ahead and give me a follow. Uh, Amy, I did not take, so Amy asked, did you specialize in data cura curation and this? I did not take any data classes at all. I took like the most library of the library library classes. So I took like reference and collection development and, uh, um, you know, those things. And I didn't do any data. I didn't do any programming. And um, I kind of regret it, but at the same time, those are things that I can learn on my own and, and I'm, am interested in. I would highly recommend to everybody to take the databases class. That was the class that I was like, I'm never going to use this. And then it turned out to be freaking essential. Okay, so Meg just pasted it in there. I, I took it with Kathy Blake, who is awesome. Uh, you learn how to work with like MySQL and Microsoft Access and uh, you know, guess what? Like data lives in databases. It doesn't live in Excel spreadsheets anymore and it's a huge competitive advantage if you know how to properly structure and utilize a database. So couldn't, couldn't recommend that more. I also took uh, web design, um, which I, I really enjoyed, but again, um, web design is something that you can learn by yourself very easily. There's like no barrier to entry. Everything is open source. Everything is easy. MOOCs, yeah, exactly. You could do Codecademy. You could do something through Coursera. Um, very, very easy to learn on your own. Um, the nice thing about the web design course is that you come out of it having designed a library website and then you can put that in your portfolio and show people, which I totally did and totally helped me get the job that I did out of, out of school. Zena asked, how do you get your foot in the door? Where do you find internships that deal with data visualization or infographics? Wow, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to because I'm, I'm a librarian who's interested in data visualization. I am not a data visual, visualizer, visualizer. Um, but it's, that's a really great question. Um, I would say look for assessment positions in libraries. Um, try to work with assessment at the, the assistantship level. Uh, I was on the library assessment working group as a uh, GA and that really helped me. It gave me a lot of raw data to work with. It also helped me define what data we collected. Uh, so I would, I would definitely recommend that. Um, you can work with assessment in many different areas. Like if you're a GA, you can be like, hey, um, you know, David Ward, I want to do some assessment stuff of our undergrad reference statistics and he'll, he'll totally be down and you can maybe publish a paper with him or something. Eric, also talk um, about like using course projects. So I, would that. I mean, you know what you did with me in an independent yeah. study, you did some of that and you used many words, but did you use, did you take it upon yourself to do some of this stuff within course projects? Just to go off Zena's question. Yeah, absolutely. I would say like almost any course has data, right? So like 
collection development, reference, um, those, those courses generate data, even though they're very, very like library type courses. So if you just go ahead and make a visualization, it's going to be A, like a really impressive project that will get you an A, but it's also going to be something that you can show as you're job searching. You can put in a portfolio and people love this stuff, right? Like it, when they see that on your application, it makes you stand out and it will be something that you'll get to do in your job. Um, so definitely. The other thing I was going to say is that people who deal with um, digital libraries obviously have access to a lot of data and are asked to visualize things. So if you wanted to run an institutional repository or something like that, that would be another good type of position um, to look for. And so uh, I hope that answers your question, um, Zina. Amy asks, so what kind of projects do you work on at your job? Um, I'm at a very small behind the times community college. And honestly, while my possession is emerging tech, I actually do like proven technology of yesteryear because we didn't have a lot of pieces in place that every other academic library has. So I do an awful lot of electronic resource management. I've implemented like a proxy server and a database to track our subscriptions that we have. Um, I do a lot of web development. I uh, migrated our website from static HTML files to the Drupal content management system. Those are things that I do. I, uh, I'm on a campaign to get faculty to adopt open access textbooks, which is another thing that I've been working on very hard. So um, getting people to use ebooks, trying to save students money. I have an incredible degree of freedom, which is the great part about being an emerging tech librarian because nobody, not even my boss, knows what the heck I should be doing. So I get to just make it up. So it's basically whatever I feel is important, whatever I think is, is most needed. Um, yeah, and Meg notes that uh, many companies are interested in data visualization. That's totally true. Uh, just about anybody will take somebody that can do that because it's about persuasion ultimately, right? Like data visualization is about um, taking something that's boring and tough to understand and turning it into something that's really interesting and compelling. And so. Uh, it's a very easy way to, to sell things, to sell products, to prove your value, um, <clears throat> especially in libraries. Like that's where I, uh, why I mentioned assessment, right? Like a big thing in libraries right now is proving our value and, and m making sure that people understand the return on investment that they get. That's a field that calls for data visualization because numbers are usually uh, pretty bland just by themselves. Although Tufty uh, has another great saying, which is that like, um, what is it? It's something about, yeah, if, if your data is boring, then you've got the wrong numbers. It's a great uh, quote by him because it's like the data is always interesting, right? The data is interesting. You just need to find it, a way to present it that's interesting as well. Oh God, bioinformatics and genetic evolution are like great great potential for this. Um, and there's probably some kind of D3 plugin that does like um, double helix uh, visualization. So things like that. Um, this is definitely a problem that's being worked on in those fields. So um, certainly, certainly. Also, those fields produce uh, just unbelievable amounts of open data that you can go out and play with. So you can totally do something cool. I, uh, Brian asks, have you worked with any other web analytics other than Google Analytics? I have not. Um, PWIC, which if you're asking that question, you probably are already familiar with, uh, is sort of the, the big open source alternative. Um, actually, I guess that's not entirely true. I do some stuff with heat maps. So, um, oh gosh, now I'm not going to remember the name of these. Uh, Heat maps are really great because they, they give you a much more, uh, much more uh, sort of tangible view of how people look at and interact with your um, website. So those, those are pretty interesting. They're, they're fairly basic visualizations, but uh, they, do, they do make it a lot, a lot easier to tell what people actually look at and click, click on on your website, I would say. The other one is like mouse something. Oh God, this is going to be the world's worst result. Yeah, crazy egg. I've heard of that one. That's not the one I was thinking of. There's, there's other, some other one that has mouse in the name. 
so that's really good. I, Google Analytics is just so easy and collects so much great data and is constantly improving that I can't see myself getting away from it. Obviously, the problem there is the Google part because uh, Google is not exactly a benevolent company in terms of its data retention and privacy policies. So um, it's something that I think librarians should be aware of. And if you work at a bigger library that has its own like web services division, you should probably look into doing something open source where you can own your own data. I work at a tiny library where I get to run a massive I run the entire website, you know, I am the web services department, as well as the electronic resources department, as well as a couple other departments. So I don't really have time to do other things. I, I'm not sure that they ever throw away their data, to be honest. I, I don't think that they throw it away after two or three years. Um, there are, there are interesting options in the analytics uh, admin settings where you can do things like anonymize IP addresses by um, throwing off the last digit and stuff like that. Uh, that there are ways that you can sort of limit uh, exposure. Also, Google Analytics does obey opting out. Um, so, you know, if you individually are concerned about Google Analytics, Google produces plugins that uh, Re, uh, you know, remove the tracking. They, they write their own browser extensions that stop Google Analytics from tracking you. So at an individual level, um, that's, that's great. The problem is most of my users are not technologically literate enough to know about or care about those sorts of solutions. Did I miss anything? Um, Zena notes that R has a bioinformatic plugin. R is another really great tool. Uh, again, that's, it's more programming than plug and play. Um, so that's really nice. Are there other questions or comments? Eric has graciously um, spent a little bit more time with us today, given us our technology glitches. Um, I do want to let you know that this session has been recorded and we'll get it posted and sent out if you have friends or other colleagues that are interested. Eric, any final words? Uh, no, just to thank you, everybody, and you know, feel free to um, follow up with me on the internet. And uh, you know, good luck. Go out and make something cooler than my really poorly drawn tree map. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Eric. Appreciate your time, and um, be in touch if anybody has questions about this session or ideas for others. Bye bye.